Welcome, everybody. We're so excited to have you joining us here today as we debut our newest attribution science capability, Climate Shift Index Oceans. And I'm Bernadette woods Plackey. I'm VP of Engagement, Chief Meteorologist, and I lead our Climate Matters work. And I'm really excited to be joined by a fun and exciting team as we take you through this newest capability and how we can apply it to our work. So Climate Shift Index Ocean just launched today. It's our, it's our big launch day, and that's why we're hosting this event. And what is it, right? A lot of you are familiar with our Climate Shift Index already. That's our daily attribution tool on temperature. Now we've been able to take this capacity and apply it to ocean temperatures around the world everywhere, every day. And this is so important for so many levels. As we continue to develop our knowledge of how climate change is affecting temperatures, both in the air and in the oceans, we can now give you the resource to track that and apply it to your daily work, whether it's through the rapid intensification of tropical cyclones or how our marine ecosystems are migrating and changing. So what you're gonna learn today is introducing the Climate Shift Index Ocean, the science behind it, the tool itself, how you can use it, but also you'll get to hear from scientists about the impact of ocean warming and why that's so important in our lives. You'll also get tips on how to use the science capability and apply it to storytelling. So without further ado, let me introduce some of my friends joining me today here. We've got Dr. Andrew Pershing. He is the VP for Science at Climate Central, whose team of scientists and technologists developed this new capacity. Also, we have Dr. Janet Nye, Associate Professor at UNC Institute of Marine Sciences, whose research focuses on how environmental variability and climate change affect fish populations, marine ecosystems, and fisheries. And we've got Tevin Wooden, a broadcast meteorologist with NBC Boston, who will talk about how to incorporate the ocean CSI into weather and climate reporting and storytelling. So after the presentations, we're going to open this up to questions from the audience. And you can already start adding questions if you have them or at any point in our Q&A section there. We will get to those after the presentations. Um, and then when we're done with this too, we're going to follow up with an email with all of the resources because we've got a lot of links coming your way and a recording of this webinar. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. And first, I'm going to send this over to Andy, who's going to take us through the exciting new science. All right. Hello, everybody. It's so great to see uh, uh, all of you today and to get to join my uh, longtime colleagues and my newer colleagues. Uh, it's really great to uh, to get to launch this product. And before I go, I just want to acknowledge this was a huge team effort. Uh, these sorts of things have there's a lot going on behind the scenes from, you know, getting the data, uh, pulling together the, the graphics, designing the graphics and then starting to tell the story. So uh, there's a lot going on here. This really is a team effort, and I'm just really excited that I get to be the front man for the band. So uh, as you know, or as I hope you know, uh, two years ago, Climate Central launched the Climate Shift Index, csi.climatecentral.org. There you can pull up maps like this one. This is today's map showing the United States and Canada. And what you see on this map is, for example, the dark red areas in Texas and Louisiana and Florida, and also up in Quebec, those are places where climate change has made those temperatures five times more likely. Those are places where we really are able to quantitatively detect the fingerprint of climate change in those daily temperatures. And CSI Ocean is uh, is taking that technology and bringing it uh, into the uh, into the ocean. So I do want you to uh, put a pin in this. Remember, the CSI scale goes minus five to five. Okay, so before I show you what uh, what our tool is, I want to uh, I want to answer just to give you a little bit of framework of why did we develop CSI Ocean. Well, one one answer is that we live on a water planet. Seventy one percent of the Earth's surface. I, this is an image from a NASA uh, satellite, the Epic satellite. Yesterday, happened to catch a shot where you see almost no land, right? Just a little bit of North America up in the corner, right? Seventy percent of the Earth's surface is covered by water. And the oceans are a huge part of the climate system. They have stored 90% of the extra heat trapped by carbon pollution that humans have been putting in uh, into the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution. And so you see how, how the temperature in the ocean has changed. This is one of the clearest uh, signals that we have altered the climate of the planet, right? That we are storing way too much heat in the world. 
What the Climate Shift Index Ocean allows you to do, though, is not look at these big, big changes, but look at day-to-day -day changes at, uh, at a very fine scale. The reason we want to do that is because we want to be able to talk about impacts on ecosystems like this coral reef here, protected species like these right whales, commercial species like lobster, uh, but and also impacts on our weather uh, in terms of you know ocean-driven storms like this is Hurricane Barrel, uh, and then the impact that those storms have on people. Right, the ocean is 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 causing all of these things to change, and the Climate Shift Index Ocean allows you to connect the stories back to human-caused climate change. Okay, well, what does what do you get when you go to CSI uh, to the Climate Shift Index Ocean page? Here's uh, here's the link, and we'll make sure you get it in the chat. So one thing you can do is you can look at the temperature of the oceans. You can see that it's really warm in the Gulf of Mexico, and it's cooler up by Newfoundland. And you see the sharp break here. This is the Gulf Stream, a really important current in the North Atlantic. And so you can see those features in the ocean. Uh, and this is uh, we're showing you the daily temperature from NOAA's uh, operationally or excuse me optimally interpolated SST OISST product. We also, though, can look at, okay, where are those temperatures unusual? Where are they warmer than you would expect based on the, the last 30 years? So you see a blob in the Pacific. You see some cooling off of the Northeast. You see you know big red splotch in the center of the North Atlantic. You see these kind of uh, blue waves in the uh, along the equator. This is the La Nina that's developing right now. Uh, and so you can see that in this image. And so then we bring in the Climate Shift Index Ocean, which tells you where those temperatures can be confidently linked to climate change. So where climate change is making the odds of those temperatures much more likely. Uh, and one thing I wanna point out is the scale. So you see, first of all, like this big red blob in the North Atlantic absolutely stands out. That water is 800 times more likely. The temperatures in those waters, climate change made the temperature in those waters more than 800 times more likely, right? We are seeing now, day to day in, in these kind of features in the ocean, where has climate change really had its fingerprint now on the ocean, just like we can with the, uh, with the, the CSI for the air? The reason we have to go to this incredibly large scale is because 90% of the heat uh, that humans have put that have caused to be trapped on planet Earth is in the ocean. And so we see this much clearer signal of warming in the ocean, uh, even more clearly than we do in our day to day weather uh, up on land. So uh, before I show you the tool, one more quick thing, just to show you that there, there is a lot of methods and a lot of research behind this. So Joseph uh, Giguer, who's uh, one of our analysts here at Climate Central, led the work to develop the methodology along with myself and Daniel Guilford. We use NOAA's uh, uh, NOAA data. We look at local warming trends. This is the same methodology used for air CSI. Uh, and then we also use climate models, and we bring all of this together to get this estimate of how climate change has altered the odds of the temperatures that we observed. Okay, and now what I'd like to do is show you the tool. So we go over to Chrome, you'll see the same map that I was showing you. So this is our interactive map. Uh, you, can, you can move around, right? You can click and uh, if you click on a region of the ocean, you can see, for example, that this uh, location in the middle of the Atlantic, a thousand times more likely due to climate change. Climate change has just radically altered the odds of getting those temperatures. They're virtually impossible without climate change. Um, I can go to the anomalies, sea surface temperature, right, and, and click back and forth. But the other feature I wanna show you, and this is, I think, really exciting, is that you can we can show you where the tropical cyclones are. Here, uh, only hurricanes and tropical storms in the Atlantic. So this is the track of, uh, of what is now tropical storm Ernesto. Uh, you're seeing the temperature, and here I'll go back to the Climate Shift Index Ocean, uh, on August 11th, so a couple of days ago, which is actually the last day that we have data for the uh, OISST uh, often runs a couple of days behind. Uh, so you can see when it was uh, uh, on August 11th, the storm was here, and it was experiencing conditions that were 1.3 degrees Celsius above normal. Uh, those water temperatures are 50 times more likely due to climate change. And uh, I mentioned Hurricane Barrel. We have actually a case study where we worked that up. 
Hurricane Barrel was really interesting because on June 30th, it underwent rapid intensification. The warm ocean water was fueling explosive growth of that hurricane. That warm ocean water, according to our system, was 200 times more likely. So that storm developed in an ocean environment that was radically altered by climate change. Climate change was fueling the growth of that storm. And I'm going to uh, stop here and uh, encourage you to play around with this tool and would love to answer questions uh, after my colleagues speak. Thank you, Andy. One quick little edit. The 11 o'clock update has come out from the National Hurricane Center and Ernesto is hanging on at hurricane status right now. So just want to clarify that for everybody that we are trying to pay attention to that. Things are evolving. Uh, so with that, one of the key things and key reasons that we even developed this science is why does this matter to people, right? The science is fascinating when you're a scientist, but why does ocean warming matter in our lives? And there are a lot of applications for this from how it's changing weather, tropical cyclones, nor'easters, a lot of different storm systems, atmospheric rivers, also how it's bleaching our oceans and how it's affecting our critters that live in the oceans and our ecosystems in the oceans that so many of us depend on. And so to go a little deeper on one of those key applications, we invited Dr. Janet Nye to talk about these warming ocean temperatures and the impact on marine ecosystems. So go ahead, Janet. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And I'm excited to see this new product and uh, all these people here. Oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong uh, slide. Um, I am a professor down at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, and, you know, we're, we're watching closely the hurricanes too, um, but I study the effects of climate change on marine ecosystems and particularly fish and fisheries and how that affects people. Um, and just speaking as, you know, someone that has lived in both New York and North Carolina recently, um, certainly the general public and fishermen are seeing these changes on a daily basis and are really concerned. Um, and so as a marine ecologist, we kind of have a simple way to remember how these warming temperatures affect uh, marine organisms, and that is move, adapt, or die. Um, and so I focused a lot of my uh, research effort on that first one, um, how species are moving or shifting their distribution to respond to some of these temperatures. And so what we're really seeing globally in both marine and terrestrial environments is a, a, a redistribution of, the, of life on Earth. Um, in general, what we expect to see um, is species shift to more northward or poleward shifts, if you think about the southern hemisphere as well. And so as um, temperatures warm, we expect to see, in general, um, these species shift northward. And so one of my favorite examples from my time in the northeast is uh, the black sea bass. This is actually a, the northernmost grouper species. Um, and it is distributed all up and down the East Coast. And then in the Northeast and Gulf of Maine area, um, you know, the, the fisheries expert in the 1950s thought, you know, we would never, you know, see them reproducing in the Gulf, meaning the Gulf of Maine. Um, sometimes you saw the rare black sea bass in the Gulf of Maine, and they certainly wouldn't be um, abundant enough to support a fishery there. But um, I'm going to try to show this video. This is what we see of black sea bass, where you see they're really abundant in the 70s. Excuse um, me, Janet. Yep. Yeah, we're not seeing your slides. You're not seeing my slides at all? Yeah. No, I think you need to hit uh, share screen. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Um, sorry, I, I hit share before and then I... I uh... We've got you now. You do see it? We do. We see. We're seeing, yeah, the we uh, web browser. You. Okay, sorry. So you're seeing this video, Black Sea Bass Mountain. Yep. Look at it. Nice. That makes sense. That makes sense because now I can't see it. Um, so this is an example from a Black Sea Bass. Again, it goes up and down um, the whole east coast of the U.S. But um, what I'm showing you, some data from NOAA, um, starting in the 70s, 60s, and 70s, where you can see they're really abundant in the south, and then um, 
you start to see them become more and more abundant as we see temperatures along the East Coast um, warm. And you start to see less and less of them in North Carolina. So for us in North Carolina, we are losing black sea bass and um, our, you know, states like New York and, and Maine are, are gaining them. Um, and they've sort of, before the, the 80s or 90s, we never really saw black sea bass north of Cape Cod, again, with the occasional straggler. But now um, what you can see, these dots are sort of the abundance of black sea bass. Um, and they've established a population and, um, you know, a fishery in the Gulf of Maine. So we're seeing these changes all over the world, um, these species moving into new areas and moving out of the areas that we used to see them. Now, if you can't move, you know, fish are, are mobile, they can, they can move, um, but if you can't move or if you can't move enough, um, you either have to adapt or you, we might, we're seeing changes in growth and productivity and really the health of these organisms if they stay in place. Um, so this is just an example from a paper where we have the number of marine heat wave days. So those are the number of days above sort of the historic um, temperature. And you just see more, obviously more coral bleaching. We see those um, articles in the news um, quite frequently, we see decreases in seagrass density. And here in North Carolina, we are seeing a change from our um, temperate seagrass to our more tropical seagrass. And in places like California, Australia, Tasmania, we see uh, declines in kelp where these species can't really move. And so um, we see declines in abundance and um, not very much evidence of adaptation, although um, we're hopeful that some of the more resistant strains to, to temperature um, persist and can, can maintain these populations. So again, how does this affect people? Um, and there's lots of different ways that people can respond, but um, people tend not to want to move as much as the fish and uh, whales and other things move. So um, this is one way that fish can respond. This is um, showing the mean latitude of uh, the fish species. And you can see that really um, striking shift to higher latitudes. Um, but you can see the landings of the fish don't really change. So the, the fishermen can kind of um, stay in the same place and um, what, many fishermen do are switching to different species. That can be really expensive to, you know, have to buy new gear, um, learn how to fish new species, maybe even buy new boats. And so, but that is one way to adapt, switch to different species. Um, and we see that just with lots of different species in the Northeast. Um, one example, another example I like to show is summer flounder. Um, again, you see this, their distribution, the dark red areas are um, high abundance of this species. Um, once really abundant in, in my home state of North Carolina. And now we see this species really much more abundant in New York and um, much northern latitudes. And so um, the North Carolina fishermen have ad adapted to that by changing and having to travel further to catch those species. So. Um, this orange line is the North Carolina uh, area where North Carolina fishermen have historically caught summer flounder off of North Carolina. Um, and now what you see is that they're having to travel up here to catch those fish and they still, but they still land them in North Carolina. So they're able to fish the same species, but they have to drastically change how they fish and is not as profitable um, as, as it once used to be. So this, you know, these are the questions that we wrestle with as, as fishery scientists. Um, those are a few examples. Um, there's also um, a resource called DISMAP where you can find um, a fish species uh, and look how they're shifting in um, any part of the US, it's called DISMAP. Um, and I think they were gonna provide that link in the, in the chat. And I'm happy to answer um, more questions about how marine species are adapting um, to climate change. 
Thanks, Janet. And and one quick question I have before we move on to Tevin here is not just the anglers needing to adapt gear or how far they travel, but this really interferes with local policy on what fish you can catch where and when, and then whole economies are based on that. So could you just take a minute or two to just summarize how that's evolving? Because that's really messy from what I understand. Yes, it is a very uh, thorny issue. Um, so we do have to do some work to figure out, you know, I mean, I think the summer flounder and the black sea bass example is, is are good examples of where they're leaving one area becoming um, an important fishery that northern states really can't take advantage of quite yet because they don't have what we call the allocation of, of that quota. And so, yeah, that is a negotiation that is ongoing. Um, and it's also, you know, things like um, physical infrastructure, fish houses, um, people that, you know, provide the ice and, and harp, you know, the, the marinas for certain kinds of boats, all that, all that has to change. And of course, um, hurricanes uh, affecting that infrastructure is a big issue here in North Carolina and, and in the South. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. And there are a bunch of questions already starting to pop up. So we'll be circling back to those. But before we do, I want to bring Tevin into this conversation. As we know, broadcast meteorologists have been using attribution science to link climate change to weather, including daily temperatures. And Tevin's done a lot with that. Another key application with the ocean temperatures as we started to talk about at the beginning is how that's going to affect a lot of storm systems, whether it's tropical cyclones, atmospheric rivers, or in Tevin's case, living in Boston, it's gonna affect a lot of nor'easters as we've already been seeing. So Tevin does a great job of integrating this data into his morning forecast at NBC Boston. So he's joining us to talk a little bit more how he's done that and how he plans on bringing in oceans to his full range of forecasts and storytelling. All right, Kev, Tevin. Uh, Bernadette, Andy, thank you guys so much, uh, and the entire team at Climate Central for developing, I think, another uh, really a, a bang-up tool that a lot of broadcast meteorologists will be able to, to use and put into their toolkit. This is another tool in the toolkit. It's not the only tool in the toolkit to, uh, to get the job done, but there's certainly an appetite, I think, for awareness around climate change for our viewers, be it in an evening broadcast or like myself in the morning. But they want it cleanly, they want it concise, and they also want it crisp or easy to read. And this is that. I think Andy called the uh, previous tool the OGCSI, um, but this is another now, uh, you can call it the second iteration if you want to, uh, of the CSI for the oceans. And I think that from the feedback that I've gotten so far from viewers is that not only do they want it, but they want more of it. And I think that shows how powerful of a tool that this really can be. Uh, be it from the land surface temperature or to what we see with our oceans. So frequently, I think as broadcast meteorologists, we may say something, but we, we don't show it and the viewer can't see it. We are now able to say it, you can see it and you can show it and really put together a full uh, story with a sort of multifaceted approach on how you're going to tell that story. And I think that's maybe some of the comments uh, that I've gotten about the original uh, CSI that I posted to, to threads, this was back in February, and someone immediately called it out and says, this CSI, it actually works, it makes sense. Um, and we know that time as broadcast meteorologists is precious, which is why the more clean and concise it is, the better it is to be interpreted in terms of what our viewers may be able to uh, see and comprehend. How I plan to implement this uh, on a routine day or on a forecasting routine day may look a little bit different depending on the season. Season, Of course, if we've got marine layers or sea breezes rolling in, we could easily take a look at what our current ocean temperatures are for the day uh, and how that may be anomalous compared to the average month or year or given time of the season. But then it may actually also be quite implemental too for Logan Airport where our ASOS station is that is immediately surrounded by water compared to you know, the far northern fringes of our viewing area, which is quite literally the Canadian uh, U.S. border, are as far south as uh, Western Connecticut and New York State for our NECM viewers, which is our six state region broadcast. I also think to uh, winter weather days where we are meticulously uh, tweaking snow maps every five seconds. 
Well, now not, not only is it a snow map, but it's a rain snow map. And this may be another way to interpret ocean temperatures and how anomalous or abnormally warm they are um, and sort of break down to the viewer that, you know, 50 years ago, you may have had an all snowstorm. Uh, but because this nor'easter is tracked more so on the coast and, you know, warmer sea surface temperatures that may be five to 15 degrees warmer than the norm, now we've got to talk about the possibility of Boston getting all uh, rain while Worcester and the Worcester Hills gets six to 12 to 18 inches of snow. Um, I mean, it makes our job a lot harder, but it also makes our job a lot easier. And I think at the end of the day, we are doing our viewers a disservice if we do not convey the climate connection uh, to what we see from a weather standpoint. And this is now what we can use to connect the dots. Uh, just to go back to uh, Dr. Dr. Nye and how she spoke about the Gulf of Maine warming, I just did a story last November about how uh, marine life has been altered over the course of 60 years for some fishermen. And we were able to connect that story to another story that talked about Visa the Seven Fishes on how not only in uh, Dr. Nye mentioned the permits and the regulators having to adapt and the laws can't catch up quick enough, but fisheries and chefs are also adapting too. And so you, you're able to take a whole sort of approach to your storytelling other than just looking at the science or looking at the numbers. And you're now able to quantify, uh, connect it to climate, and then make it a sort of a, a C to table solution on what climate change looks like. So I, I am excited to use this tool. Um, I can't wait to use it. Hopefully I'm not using it for tropical, well, I guess Hurricane Ernesto now uh, in four or five days as that storm makes it into the North Central Atlantic. Uh, so great job. One of the impressive ways I've seen you apply the overall understanding, it didn't necessarily connect a CSI in the moment, but it's that background knowledge that allows you to make the connections is in the environmental justice special that you pulled together with a lot of your own time and resources. It was very impressive. And so if you could also just speak to, even if not you're not using this in a daily way, how it builds that knowledge, that confidence, that capability to apply to additional storytelling and conversations. Yeah, so I look at broadcasting as, you know, we're not trying to give our viewer all of the information at once. As much as, me, as, much as we may want to as scientists, we can't do it to where it's comprehended uh, like we would want it to. So being able to take two minutes here to maybe just explain one concept and then build on it in the next 15 minutes and then build on it in 15 more minutes when you have another hit. Now your entire day of broadcast are, is more of a storytelling piece than just your one your one component of a two to three minute weather hit. And so what Dr. Uh, or what Bernadette is referring to with uh, our environmental justice special, we spent 30 minutes breaking down uh, environmentally ju uh, environmental justice, what that is, and also formerly red dye neighborhoods in Boston and connecting it to climate change. And so now, because we've done that for our viewers, we've laid the foundation. Anytime we address climate change, we can now call out specific neighborhoods and people aren't, you know, in the dark, so to speak, about why this area is hotter than this area is hotter than this area or cooler than this area. Um, so it really has been eye opening, I think, for me to show not only is there an appetite for something like this, but also, you know, it is our duty. It's our role. And we're doing our viewers a disservice if we don't. Um, I, I, broadcast meteorologists are often the first scientists that a lot of people meet other than their doctor, and maybe the only scientists that they know. Uh, so it, it's it's our responsibility to to arm the viewers with information so they are able to make a better decision about protecting their life and their property uh, uh, other than just day-to-day -day weather events. Thanks, Kevin. Kevin, sorry. So oh, help. Okay. <laughs> I know you so, have twins, so I get it. <laughs> uh, and and so I'm going to open this up now because we have a lot of chat questions coming in. We've got Q&A questions. Uh, there's just a lot going on. So I'm going to bring everyone together here in this conversation now. A couple of these that have popped up, I'm, I'm going to sort of bring it into one question for you, Andy, is on the scale, the 800 times more likely. We internally have debated this. We've gone back and forth of how best to present this information. What does it mean? How does it mean? How do you explain that? What's the value of that? So I want to give you a little more time to dig in on that. And also, how in one of the specific questions it says in the ocean, because we know 
air is moving and there's up and down motion. There's a lot of that in the ocean too. Often people think of the ocean as a little more uniform, but it has its different pulses. And so if you could talk about the scale and how it shows up in these pulses in the ocean too. Sure. So the scale, I mean, the scale is, I, I have to say, quite shocking. Um, but I think it, you know, it really comes down to the fact that the oceans are uh, in some ways ground zero for climate change. They are integrating the extra heat that we've put into the atmosphere. And so because, so our, this daily attribution approach that we have uh, that, that for both the air temperature CSI and the ocean temperature CSI, really what it's doing is disentangling the day-to-day -day swings of weather from the longer term trends driven by climate change. And in the ocean, because the day-to-day the -day swings are less, uh, there's less variability and the trends are really strong, we just get this huge signal. It's just, we can be so much more confident in the ocean that we are seeing conditions that were that have been altered by climate change, where climate change has made these conditions much more likely uh, than, they, than they would be. And in many cases, we really are in the zone where it's like, it's just hard to imagine how you could get the temperatures that we're seeing without climate change. And then to Burns' point about kind of you know different flows and patterns in the ocean, you know I saw that there was a there was a question about La Nina. If you look at the the equatorial Pacific, I showed like the little waves there. You know you will see lots of anomalies there, and that's because that area just has a lot of essentially weather, right? The equivalent of ocean weather, day to day, month to month variations in temperature, and that variability we account for that variability in our system, and so we will get much lower. Uh, values of the ocean CSI in that location, because a lot of times what you're seeing in that region, it looks like uh, kind of more, you know, more traditional natural variability. Whereas when you move into the center of the North Atlantic, you move into the North Pacific, you move into the Gulf of Mexico, you really are seeing the trends and we are, we're seeing those big, big changes uh, in the ocean environment. Thank you. And yes, one of those questions came from our buddy, Joe Witte. Joe, it's great to have you on here as always. So this next question, likely Janet or Andy could answer it. Um, noticing that the barrier beach of Long Island, the beach is now slanted. The ocean ushers the sand up and has caused a significant incline on the beach itself. And so I think this question is getting at the rate at which the ocean, like the beach and the land's going to be covered by water versus the warming. So I think this gets into sea level rise in addition to our ability to attribute the actual temperature in the ocean to climate change. So could someone get in on how this warming connects to the sea level rise and the predictions that we're seeing? I, I'd i be happy to answer that. I used to live on Long Island, um, lived and worked there and, um, I think there's two issues to think about when um, thinking about the barrier islands. One is, you know, that the um, warming that we're experiencing also expands the water. And so that contributes a lot to sea level rise. Um, it's difficult to predict when we might see that um, sea level rise overcome the barrier islands. Um, one of the reasons that I found out he here in North Carolina is because hurricanes are a big um, factor in determining um, the shape and the structure of those barrier islands. So when when we've had hurricanes, Hurricane Sandy, for example, put a um, breach into Fire Island, and um, you know those breaches breach events are going to dramatically change how quickly those barrier islands are going to. Um, retreat or just be overcome by the by sea level rise. And here in North Carolina, we had you know seventy five breaches from the last um, you know hurricane five years ago, um, and not always caused by the the hurricane coming in, but the flow of water from rivers coming out um, and making breaches. And so and that just changes how quickly those barrier islands. Um, may change. And just to add one more thing, kind of the, the comment about the steepness of the shoreline, that's driven a lot by the wave activity. And so it may be an indication that there's potentially a trend in, you know, an additional waviness uh, in the ocean more and which reflects the kind of the more powerful storms 
uh, that we're talking about, uh, especially you know, driven by some of these more um, warmer ocean temperatures. Just to add another point to that, at Climate Central, for those who don't know, we have a very robust sea level rise program that has a lot of mapping tools that can show you future risk of what would be underwater for different amounts of water rise in different either cumulative warming totals or projected years. So if you go to climatecentral.org, you can find that. There's a lot of really good stuff on there. Andy, this is a question for you from Jim Gandy. Jim, great to hear from you. How far back is the data available? Uh, great. Well, I wasn't sure whether that was a question for me for the Ocean CSI, whether it's a question for Janet for the fish data. So oh. we can we can add, ask both, both of you. Both of you go. <laughs> So, you know, for right now, if you go to the uh, to the Ocean CSI tool, uh, you can go back through June. That's as, that's when we started the system running, uh, and that's what we've made available. We actually have data going all the way back from 1982 through present, which is the full record of the NOAA OISST product, uh, and we're using that internally uh, as a research tool. Uh, and so that's something that you know if folks are interested in. They can contact me, and I can you know I can try to get you set up with uh, with the data. Um, uh, Janet, do you want to talk about the fish data? Sure. I think um, in the U.S., we're lucky in that we do have many long-term data sets that, you know, I've, I've showed you some of those on the East Coast and the Northeast. That data goes back to the 60s and 70s, and that was collected by NOAA. Um, in the Southeast U.S., um, we have good data going back to more like the, in the 90s. Um, um, in California current, there are some data sets that go back to the fifties, um, for the fish, for the fish data. That's fantastic. And for, I would say for the fish data, we're really lucky when you think about zooplankton or whales like that, that tends not to be, um, as long data sets, but because fisheries are important, um, those data sets go back further. And one last point, Andy put out there to contact us for data. If you're working on a specific story or project and you really want to dig in at a deeper level, what we've put out is for daily use for everyone to access. But we've got so much more data and Andy does love playing with data. So do reach out and we can work on some of that. So Tevin, this is it for you. Um, it talks about how to promote this tool for weather casters in the UK. And I don't know if it's necessarily your role to promote it, but I would think it'd be how to communicate with fellow weather casters, not just here in the US, but in the UK and how they could use it. Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, promoting it, I guess, as a uh, you know, bi-weekly spokesperson or something like that. It at first I think there may be hiccups just because you have to get used to the terminology. Um, you have to get used to incorporating the technology into your weather system, which for, uh, I, I think, uh, most of us here in the Americas, it's um, WSI, uh, TrueView Max, and we've been using utilizing that for several several years for most of our broadcasters. But there's a KML file that gets downloaded uh, from Climate Central, and you're able to, quite literally, like you're importing a photo, you're importing the KML data that is tied to uh, your topography or your map. Um, so... That's step one and two. Once you're comfortable with it, and then once you have the the images imported, I think promoting it really just boils down to what do you want to focus on. And remember, if you think back to 15 minutes ago, I'm speaking, this is one tool in the toolkit. It's not an everyday tool, um, but I think once you get comfortable with it and your viewers get comfortable with it, then it can become a oh, you know, we just talked about that CSI last week, and now here comes Ernesto charging right into again those abnormally warm waters and maybe then bring it back out for another hit or two. Um, promoting it, I do try to say Climate Central as much as I can because uh, that gives credit to the, the good folks at CEC or C Squared that developed it. Um, and it's really nothing more than that. I don't think you have to, you don't have to dive too deep into the, 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 the rigmarole of the science. I think you just have to remember that your viewers have zero basis for the most part of climate change knowledge and then build from there. Does that kind of answer your question? That's good. And also UK specifically, I don't know if the question came from someone in the UK or not, but different storms are driven by different coastal mechanisms. But so yeah. often our storms are connected to the oceans as Andy started out this entire thing. We forget it sometimes, but it is most of our planet. And so the warming doesn't stop when temperatures are warm. 
right? Even if they're cooler temperatures, they're still above average. And that warming is fueling the storms that are coming to the UK, the British Isles, a lot of Europe in general. So this can apply really anywhere that's working with weather. Right. And that, that might actually be another good point to, to sort of draw in is, you know, if you're looking at a storm that's on the way and it's already gone through abnormally warm waters, um, at some point, maybe it should be concern or maybe it should be re reassessed that that storm would have died out before it even got that far. Uh, but now it's got a little bit more juice with it. That's a really good point. So this one shifts a little to loving this product and data. Are there comparable indices or an index for more inland waters, the Great Lakes specifically, or the upper Midwest or rivers, whatever. And I know this is always a goal to keep applying this to more. We don't have it quite yet, but Andy, if you could bring them in on the latest science there. Sure. So the the OISST product that is the 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 kind of the backbone of the Ocean Climate Shift Index is uh, it does include the Great Lakes and some of the larger lakes around the world, like Lake Victoria and uh, you know, places like that. And so on our tool, you can actually look up the temperature and you, you can look up the temperature anomaly in those locations. We're not actually making a state, an attribution statement about those temperatures at this point. And that has a lot to do with just how, how they're represented in the climate models. The climate models do a really good job representing air temperature. They do a really good job representing ocean temperature and ocean circulation. They don't do a great job representing uh, lakes. In fact, many of them just won't have uh, you know, have lakes in them. And so that that means that we can't uh, we can't use our system there. Uh, but certainly the Great Lakes are really, really interesting. Um, there was another question I saw about uh, about the Arctic and the Antarctic, why we're sort of, why we're clipping uh, the latitudes. Um, obviously, those are regions that are that are hugely sensitive to climate change, especially in you know in the Arctic. Um, we at this point are not are not showing uh, our calculations up there. We are making them. Um, but we there's there's real challenges around ice. Uh, and the hard thing about ice, our system assumes what likes temperature and temperature is really great because it's, you know, everything you can you can basically measure the temperature of anything. The challenge is ice because ice is is always in the ocean. Uh, what is it? Um, minus 3.5 degrees Celsius uh, or, you know, so just just a little bit uh, below freezing. And so that just creates a, sp a kind of a spike in temperature, and it and it makes our statistics really hard. So we we need to kind of do uh, develop some special approaches to deal with these uh, areas where ice is really important. That's fantastic. Uh, I want to shift to Janet because there's a few different ones that get to your specific area of expertise here, and. One got into kelp, and it had to do with for the non-mobile living creatures in our water. Are there some ways to engineer to help build in resistance? And I also would like you to explain the real importance of kelp for everyone. I mean, I know I'm someone who's in science, spent my whole life there, cared about this. But last year I was out at Channel Islands and I learned so much more about the value of kelp that I did not appreciate. So I think even starting there is really good. And then what's being done about it? Yeah, um, thanks for that question. So kelp, along with coral reefs and seagrasses, I highlighted those because those are foundational species. And really the whole ecosystem is built around those foundational species and increase the productivity and health of all the organisms that depend on them for structure, um, food, and um, things like that. So kelp, I don't, you know, there are some um, programs for corals to breed resistance into corals. I mean, we're also doing a natural experiment on, um, you know, those corals that survive marine heat wave events are those are the ones that are going to be more resistant to, to future um, heat wave events. And perhaps that's, a you know, nature's best way to build resistant might be better than, you know, bringing those things into the lab. Um, even with things like oysters and crabs, um, we see really local um, sort of populations and genetic structure, and those might be really, really important in breeding resistance. So, you know, that's that interacts with fishing and harvesting. If you are harvesting a lot of these potentially really resistant 
um, populations, you could be decreasing the ability of those organisms to adapt. So it's really important to, con to try to keep genetic diversity and not over harvest um, in, in light of climate change. Um, I don't know about any um, breeding programs for kelp or anything like that. I do know in Tasmania, Australia, they've been doing a lot of work on um, the kelp forests there, which have been um, sort of decimated by warming and been overtaken by urchins. Um, so now we have, you know, a, a ecosystem dominated by urchins, much like, you know, we sometimes see in uh, the west coast of the U.S. And so there, there are some efforts to, um, I don't want to say plant because <laughs> it's not a plant, um, but to, um, you know, reintroduce kelp into the ecosystem. And I, so maybe there is some sort of um, breeding program for that. Thank you. Appreciate that. It was amazing being out there in the Channel Islands and anchoring yourself to kelp to like not float away. I was so scared I was going to damage it. So I learned a lot. Uh, <laughs> um, this gets into a lot of ocean currents. So I'm going to start with you, Andy, but Janet, you probably have stuff to add to this also. And I'm going to combine a couple of different questions because we have so much coming in. Thank you, everybody. Uh, in our Q&A from Max, he says, is there data to show trends and currents with a lot of interest in the AMOC strength lately? But also at the same time, Matt Zafino brought up cooling in the Northwest right now. And it is is that upwelling connected to climate change? So could you talk about some of the trends we're seeing in currents on both sides of the country and upwelling also? Um, yeah, great, great question. So, you know, the slowdown in the AMOC, the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, uh, is something that, you know, is a very active area of research. It's one of these potential climate tipping points. Uh, and so the idea is like if you um, that, you know, some of the flow of water in the Atlantic is maintained by the fact that you have cold, uh, fresh water, uh, or sorry, cold water, cold, salty water in the north that sinks. And, uh, and that, um, that sort of drives some of the, the transfer of heat. There's worry that melting in the Arctic is, is going to slow down that process. Um, and so there's a lot of interest in trying to understand that. So it's, there's some new sensor platforms that are out there. Uh, I think we're now getting to the point where maybe we have a five years to a decade of like really, really excellent data. Uh, and then there are sort of proxy data that, that people have looked at uh, over longer term that does. Uh, most of these tend to show some slowdown. And the question is, you know, how quickly will that, uh, will that develop? Um, you know, as far as upwelling goes, I, um, you know, that is, uh, I don't actually know whether there's a, you know, whether there's a strong climate link to upwelling. I'm sure, I'm sure there is, because it's going to be reflected, it's going to be indicated by the, or altered by the, you know, especially by the heat on land and the distribution between heat uh, across the land ocean uh, boundary. Um, um, but one of the things that we do take into account in our system is seasonality, which is an important part of, uh, of what drives upwelling. So many places will have upwelling that will be stronger in one season and less in another. That will make the water cooler when that happens. Uh, but we can, we can account for that and say whether it's cooler than you would expect and then make an attribution statement about that. I'll just add to that um, about upwelling. Um, I'm doing research in two new areas in the Galapagos and and the Southeast US. And interestingly enough, it does seem like both of those areas have an intensification of upwelling. And we are seeing cooling um, really close to the shore in the Southeast. And that's causing uh, recruitment failure in a lot of our reef species. So that means they're reproductive. Um, capacity has been really, really horrible for um, the, the decade. I don't know if that will continue um, with ocean changes. Uh, and then in the Galapagos, we see this, you know, spot on the Western side of um, the Galapagos, even with, you know, and so we, you know, obviously st they still see that signal, um, but it's, it's cooling. Uh, so it's an interesting, you know, sort of opposite, opposite um, of the warming signal, but having a dramatic effect on the species that are adapted to very different conditions than what they're experiencing recently. And, and so this is the fun of science, right? Stay tuned. This is evolving science. Uh, is it 
I shouldn't say this is fair to say, because I don't know enough to, to put it out there that way, but sort of we're there, right? When something goes up and goes down, if we're seeing stronger currents up somewhere, is that creating a strong, is there a climate connection to that or we just don't know yet? I don't know. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> Maybe somebody else does, but I don't know. Yeah, I haven't made that connection yet. Okay, so stay tuned to her research. A lot more to learn and a lot yeah. to go to. Whatever. Yeah. Love to go there someday. Um, so this next one's for Andy and Tevin. And again, trying to combine a couple of pieces here. So the data that comes in, what is the uncertainty around it? The slight delay, and how do you or do you address the uncertainty within that, Tevin? So Andy, data first, then we're gonna go to Tevin. Sure. So I saw that uh, from Kyle, who I worked with years ago in Maine. So hey, Kyle. Um, so that's a it's a great question. We do actually calculate uncertainty. Uh, we are not communicating that as part of our tool. We've tried to do is build into the scale enough enough uh, breadth in the numbers that you're that when we when we give you a number, we're giving you uh, we're giving you kind of a bucket that contains the variability. So that's the way we've tried to address it. That accounts for the uncertainty, but also makes the public communications. Uh, simpler. Oh, and then the other the other question about the data. Unfortunately, so we are dependent on NOAA, and normally NOAA releases yesterday's data today, and so usually we're gonna the tool is gonna be one day behind. They've had a few glitches this summer where occasionally they've gone they've actually run several days behind, and we seem to be unfortunately in one of those glitchy periods where uh, the eleventh uh, is the last day that we are uh, that we have data for right now. But thankfully, you know, ocean temperature doesn't change that much day to day, so you can you can actually do quite a bit. Yeah, uh, you know, ocean temperatures from a few days ago are pretty good indication of what they're what they're likely to be today. Real quick before I give it to you, Tevin. That's just another sign of the importance of our agencies and what they do. And I just have to give a shout out to them because they do so much amazing work that we're able to learn so much more and apply it to other work. So Tevin, go ahead. Isn't it like $7 per year per taxpayer is about how much the NWS and NOAA gets. Uh, but clearly I can shell out maybe 10 more dollars on my behalf, but perhaps not the entire uh, country. Um, anyway, to go back to the question at hand, uh, you guys were talking about the data and the uncertainty. I think I'm glad Andy mentioned the uncertainty and how that's built into the scale because there's there's always that uncertainty, right? Like we have a 20% chance of rain. There's a lot of uncertainty that it's not raining today versus if it actually is or not. Um, but I look to convey the certainty because there's always uncertainty. So how strong is that correlation to uh, warming in the North Central Atlantic or along the Mid-Atlantic coast? Is it 100 times? Is it 200 times? Is it 800 times? And how does that overall fit into the context of the story? Unfortunately, going back to the uh, data and the delays, uh, I think that was one question that I had actually, Andy, a couple of weeks ago when we talked about this was how quick is that turnaround time? And it's okay that it's not instantaneous. Um, I, I think the best part about the ocean is that the fluctuations don't vary as great day to day, like Andy just mentioned. So if we you know, if we're as a broadcast meteorologist, if if we or if I'm tracking a storm, be it a nor'easter or a hurricane, you're not going to have a sharp great uh, vari variability. Um, at the very least, something that's very large. I think there may be, especially in the winter, depending on how sharp a cold front coming down may be and how far. You know, if that's a mile or two off the coast, that may be need to be redressed. But for your larger scale systems like tropical entities, I think it's okay to use. I don't want to call it old data. It's just data from a different day. And then it's up to you as a broadcast meteorologist to interpret it, to say, you know, well, this is why we saw this. And this is what forecast guidance would give us going out for the next two or three days. So you're able to talk more about the past, which gets you to the present. And then you can connect the dots to the future. It's not always going to be a future uh, element or story. No matter how much we, how much we, we may want it to be. <laughs> Well explained there. So this one, I know we've talked about this in scientific circles a lot, but it does still get lost sometimes on the public of how we can look at projections 50 to 100 years. And, and dissecting the five to 10, you sort of go from that prediction to projection space and that day-to-day to, -day to seasonality to long-term. This is, this is an area where I know Noah and a lot of others are investing some serious time and effort. But Andy, could you speak on the ocean side where we'll come out with sea level rise projections 50 to 100 years, 
versus five to ten, and why? So, yeah, so a great question. So you can think of you can think of a few different scales and what the drivers are. So on the weather scale that Tevin deals with, the drivers are basically where's the heat right now, right down to like as fine a detail as you can get, uh, and the moisture and everything else that determines the weather on a very fine scale, and that information leaks out and it becomes less accurate, you know, as you get into five, 10 uh, days and longer. You then have, if you go out to long term, right, 50 years, 100 years, what's driving that is how much carbon dioxide we have in the atmosphere. It is absolutely 100% driven by that, which determines how much heat there is. And so that's why we can make very confident predictions about how warm things will be, how much sea level rise there will be, uh, you know, at at those kind of decade or multi-decadal scales. And then there's this like really hard time, this time period in kind of the seasonal to maybe, you know, a few years out. Uh, and that's really where there's a lot of an amazing research that's being uh, that's being done by NOAA and others to try to improve the forecasts in that in that timeline. Uh, and this is where the ocean becomes super important because at those scales, where the heat is, it's in the ocean, and that determines a lot of the predictability you get on uh, on those scales. And so the real nut that, that those forecasters have to crack is to actually have a really, really, really good ocean model that's then coupled to your weather model, and you have to get those talking in the right way. And one other point I'd put, too, is even when we look long term, you still see patterns in the modeling, and we take chunks of it and average it out to show you where it's going. So when you get to those variability peaks and in the shorter term, it may it may play out a little differently, right? So when we look out longer term, it's averaged over decades and decades, and you lose some of the year to year spiciness of it within there. And it could really trigger the wrong way in a shorter five to 10 that could set people up wrong for decision making around that. So that's that. I we're out of time almost. Uh, if if Jana, if you could do this one in a minute because Ernesto, I missed this earlier. But talking about the warming in the waterways in North America, particularly on salmon fisheries. Uh, so like inland waterways. Yeah, it's like yeah. It's a little away from the oceans, but no. I mean, again, we're seeing this affecting all organisms, all ecosystems globally. Um, and um, yeah, I guess I would say, you know, there's Atlantic salmon and Pacific salmon, so I'm not sure which one. I mean, Atlantic salmon is um, on the endangered species list. So maybe we're talking about Pacific salmon. Um, and certainly we see that um, there are big shifts in how productive those salmon um, populations are based on, you know, temperature. Um, and what we, I mean, I think what we've seen in, in the last decade is just large scale, um, as you probably know, um, failure of those fisheries because of ocean conditions, we think, um, because there's just not enough food um, for those salmon um, to return to rivers and, and spawn. So that's, that's, you know, I know the ocean part of the, the, that salmon story. I don't know if Andy wants to add in um, to that. Well, I mean, salmon are really hard because they're both, they spend a lot of time in the ocean and then they have to come ashore where they reproduce and that's where the babies come out. And so the water resource management is super important. So you have to have enough water flowing down. So that determines dams and rainfall. All of those are important patterns for salmon. And then you have temperature. And so there are cases in uh, both for you know Atlantic salmon on the East Coast and, and, and some of the Pacific salmon on the West Coast where you're seeing at the Southern end of the range, the rivers are becoming too warm and that can be a challenge for, uh, for that species. And so you're seeing them lose uh, some of the populations in the, in the rivers in the South. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for all of those who attended today. Thank you for our speakers. Thank you for everyone who helped make this reality because we cranked on this science, got it published, was able to put this through our technology team in time for this hurricane season. We are going to wrap all of this up into an email with a recording and a whole lot of amazing links that have been coming through here. So that will be coming your way. And please do reach out anytime. We want to have conversations with you. If you have questions or if you want to go deeper on data sets or try to explore something for a specific story or project that you're working on. So please do reach out. Our information will be in the email. Thanks again for joining us today and have a wonderful day.